Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to tonight's All Space Considered and welcome to 2022. Um, I'm Dr. David Reitzel and with me tonight, of course, is Patrick So and Chris Butler. We are coming to you live from home, but the, pro the this program is being broadcast live from Griffith Observatory, which of course brings you tonight's program. The Department of Recreation and Parks in the City of Los Angeles own and operate Griffith Observatory. And as always, we'd like to thank Griffith Observatory Foundation for all the wonderful support that we get. Um, now, also, we'd like to thank um, all the City of LA people, everybody in Los Angeles that helps us support Griffith Observatory. So this beautiful picture you're seeing here, um, the mountains behind and our beautiful city and with our social media. So go ahead and follow us. Um, tonight's show, we do have a really good one for you. Um, it's Friday, January 7th, and we're going to look back and look forward um, to some of the main stories. Now, we don't quite have enough time to really dive into it to every single story like we used to do, so we've really picked the highlights and trying to do a good job of them. And we're going to start with Parker Solar Pro, which was that beautiful video you just saw with the beautiful music from Bill Gruneberg, um, the animation in the middle was done by Griffith Observatory's own Chris Butler. Take a bow, Chris. Um, that, that was done for our, our wonderful online school program that Griffith Observatory Foundation actually helped support. We already have had over 35,000 kids go through the program just this school year. So it's super, super cool. And Patrick's going to tell us what Juno's done, um, looking back and then looking forward to some of the neat things that's going to happen there. Then we're going to move forward to some pretty pictures, look at some of the best ones from the year that Katie liked, and then a little bit of solar system weather. And we'll finish out the program program with our sky report out to launch and looking back and looking forward to Mars and what went on at Mars this year that was of note. So that's our exciting show. And let's kick it off with the Parker Solar Probe, just like we did with that beautiful uh, introductory video. Um, so what is the Parker Solar Probe? Well, it is a probe that is going to the sun. It's actually it, it's flying so close to the sun, it's entering the sun's atmosphere, that region we call the corona. So we've never done that before. Now it doesn't really quite get this close. This, this is a picture that was done before the mission. I believe that's a solar dynamics observatory picture in the background. So we're looking at probably x-rays there or some sort of high energy. Um, very dramatic though. Five, and indeed, four, here's the launch three, of the Parker's old two, probe. It's, it was one, a dramatic event. Zero. Lift Just off. kind of oh, crazy the, the way those Delta flames four, engulf with NASA's that Delta IV. Parker four. Solar Probe. A daring mission to shed that is light normal, on the mysteries though. of our When the flames star, come up over the, the Delta IV like that, that's completely yeah. normal when it does that. Now, the orbit it was sent into, you can see here why we're so excited about the results we're getting from the Parker Solar Probe. Previously, we've had orbiters like Bepi Colombo and Solar Orbiter going into these orbits that are close, but Mercury is even closer. We also have um, things like Stereo A, Stereo B, um, looking from a distance at other directions, but those are out the distance of Earth. So really to get close to the sun, we had to really fling the Parker Solar Probe down. Well, actually you gotta slow it down. You have to remove some of Earth's orbital velocity and let the probe fall into the sun. It's not so easy. It is harder to get down there in the sun than it is to go out to Mars or the outer planets. Because um, we already have all that energy. Earth is moving. You have to remove that energy to fall down inwards towards the sun. Um, now, what's so cool about the Parker Solar Probe? Well, we want to know. Let me run that animation again. Oh, there it goes. It's looping for us. Um, it's so cool because the sun has these streamers coming off of it, this solar wind. And we didn't really understand completely the interactions. We wanted to know the details of what was happening. Well, we noticed these sort of S-shaped features with the Parker Solar Probe for the first time. And they were called switchbacks because the material's literally kind of switching directions and heading back outwards. It's the magnetic field of the sun driving these. Um, we don't fully understand it, but it seems to be actually related all the way down to features we're seeing on the surface of the sun. It could be coming between the granules. So um, really interesting physics related to the sun that we're learning from the Parker Solar Probe. Um, now, the Parker Solar Probe itself has also flown by Venus a few times. Um, a beautiful picture here, an animation showing what it might have looked like. Venus clouded completely. We normally, human eyes wouldn't be able to see the surface ever, but the Parker Solar Probe actually has cameras that are capable of peering through those clouds, infrared cameras. So we're seeing the night glow, literally the, the, the glowing heat 
of Venus glowing in the infrared. And Aphrodite Terra is a feature that can be seen in radar images that you bounce off of there. So as it flew past Venus, it was able to see those really cool features on Venus, which I don't know if they were expecting that, but I certainly wasn't. I was pretty stunned when I saw this very cool image. Now, other things that it's done, um, it did just recently enter the sun's corona. Now, you might want to know, how do we know it entered the corona? Well, it has to do with the fact that outside the corona, material isn't being pushed at very high speeds. The corona sort of runs into the interstellar wind. The inner part of the corona, you have these very strong streamers. Outside, they slow down a little bit. So let's take a look here. We'll run a video and see if it makes any sense here, because the Parker Solar Probe streaming along in its orbit, it gets closer and closer, and it enters a region right there. Boom, now we're inside of it. Now we're in that region where the solar wind is streaming more, it's less turbulent, and you go outside into the region outside of there. So let's take a look here. Inside the corona, very high energy there. You see a certain signature. Um, outside the uh, corona, the solar wind is pushing all that material outwards. You get an outward flow. Inside the corona, the magnetic fields are driving the interactions a little bit more. The material is connected to the sun. It's part of that atmosphere of the sun. Um, the material inside can return back to the surface of the sun. It can fall back. Material on the outside is continuing on the way and becomes part of that solar wind that's leaving the surface of the sun. So Parker Solar Probe drifted into that region where it was sensing that material was coming out and then falling back in, and it's being driven by those streamers in the magnetic fields. Outside of it, the solar wind carries it away and it just flows away from the sun completely. So following along. Now, what did it look like? when it did that. It did get that data. We, we showed it to you in the middle of that movie, the actual data. Well, let's take a look here. You're seeing actual streamers of Corona. Well, that was the Milky Way that went by there, by the way. Did you see that? They were seeing the Milky Way and those bright spots. If you're looking at those, there's some of the planets. I believe almost every planet was seen in here. If you Google this one um, and find this image, let me back it up and run that again, because it's just too cool. Um, I think that might have been Venus, Earth is in here, Jupiter's in here, but what's so cool are those streamers that are going by, not the little uh, uh, streaks. Those streaks are more mm -hmm. particles that are hitting the detector. Um, cosmic rays, basically, are particles coming off the sun. It's the long, wispy streaks we're seeing that's actually the corona, and you're seeing material being carried um, away from the sun. Now, Inside that corona, that material is carried out with the magnetic field, comes back in and follows the field lines. Outside of that, it's gone. So we've crossed that boundary, which is pretty darn cool. And this was during encounters eight and nine. Um, you can see some information about the electric fields and the magnetic fields that are happening inside there. But what was unexpected was that particles were impacting the side of the Parker Solar Probe. Um, so there was high energy particles around the sun and we're getting impacts on the side. It's actually could be damaging. So interesting for future spacecraft, other craft that are gonna go into high energy areas like being close to the sun, we need to protect them against this sort of stuff. Now the Parker Solar Probe itself is doing these Venus flybys, October 16th, it just did one, it flew by hmm. Venus again. And it's not just doing these cause they're fun, um, Patrick, why don't you tell us why is the Parker Solar Probe fly flying past Venus and what does it have to do about the future of the Parker Solar Probe? Okay, sure. Uh, in fact, uh, Venus plays uh, an immense role in uh, modifying the orbit of the Parker Solar Probe. On its 10th uh, uh, flyby of Venus, um, the distance uh, where it gets close to the sun, known as the perigeus, shown by that red arrow, its closest point to the sun, uh, was reduced from uh, previously uh, 6.5 million miles from the sun to a mere 5.3 million miles uh, from the sun on this uh, orbit 10 or per uh, perihelion 10. Uh, just to take a look at where the Parker Solar Probe currently is after that close passage uh, for a perihelion 10, uh, it is right now uh, out just beyond the orbit of Venus, uh, although Venus is uh, away from the Parker Solar Probe uh, at this point. So all the green lines there that you see are all the past orbits and the future orbits are, are, are shown in uh, red. Uh, a quick look at uh, what's next for Parker Solar Probe. Uh, would, oh, actually, this is actually a detail there. You can see the... Yeah. Uh, uh, I marked a P10, which is uh, the perihelion point, 
and where Pogacilla probe is. But the next uh, uh, diagram actually shows the maximum distance, uh, which is at top there, away from the sun, and the minimum distance, uh, which is uh, when it's at its uh, perihelion close to the sun. And uh, you can see uh, on the left there, we started off with uh, perihelion one, uh, where the Parker Solar Probe was uh, within 13 million miles away from the sun. And now it's at perijove, actually, sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. At, uh, <laughs> Perihelion 10, it's, it's uh, 5.3 million miles away. Uh, so you can see uh, there's actually a total of 24 orbits on the 24th uh, orbit uh, where it gets to uh, P24, which is uh, December of uh, 20, I think it's 2024. Uh, the uh, Park Solar Probe will be uh, 4.3 million miles from the sun. At that point, it would be traveling almost uh, almost 400,000 miles uh, per hour as it gets, as it zips past its closest point uh, to the sun. Uh, let's see what we've got here. Uh, this is just the timetable from last year. You can see there were some Venus flybys uh, which uh, took it closer and closer to the sun. Uh, this year, uh, uh, there are four uh, perihelion uh, passages uh, but no Venus flyby, so the perihelion distance will be maintained at 5.3 uh, million miles. And then, of course, we have next year, uh, there is one uh, Venus flyby, but there are actually a total of uh, four more uh, 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 perihelion uh, flybys uh, for next year. So that's what we're looking forward to, and uh, this uh, will uh, continue the uh, all the uh, data gathering of uh, phases of uh, Parker Solar Probe. Just to give you an idea of what, how big the sun would look if uh, from the vantage point of Parker Solar Probe, on the right there, uh, that's the size of the sun, uh, it's just about half a degree uh, has seen in the sky, or roughly about the size of the full moon if you view it from Earth, of course, safely. But from when Parker Solar Probe is close to the sun, the sun is 28 times the diameter uh, bigger um, in its, uh, from the vantage point of the Parker Solar Probe. So it's really um, up close and personal uh, right next to the sun. Uh, the, this, this basically, this, uh, this uh, diagram just shows you that uh, Parker Solar Probe is striving to get close and close to the sun uh, to unravel some of the structure of the sun, the, the uh, the inner corona, the out, outer corona, why, why it's hot. Um, and also to gather information uh, on the uh, dust environment around the sun. So uh, more uh, interesting results uh, to come uh, as uh, uh, the Parker Solar Probe uh, journeys uh, into the uh, outer atmosphere and the inner atmosphere of the sun. Yeah, right. absolutely. I, I can't mm. wait for it to get closer and closer as it's gonna um, do these next passages after that Venus flyby, we'll get a little closer. And then we'll just keep getting more data. Um, speaking of more data, we've been getting more and more Juno passes and uh, there's still more to come, more interesting things. So what was the best of Juno in 2021 and what's to come, Patrick? All right. Well, there was a wealth of data from uh, Juno uh, that was uh, revealed in the press conferences uh, last year. There was so much that I really was trying to keep up with all the, all the uh, latest information. Um, for those of you who don't know, Juno is a spacecraft, a NASA spacecraft, as seen in this artist's uh, conception here. Um, it is the only solar powered spacecraft out in the orbit of uh, Jupiter. And it is sent there to, to give us uh, information and actually study in detail and reveal the secrets of Jupiter and its atmosphere, its core, its magnetic fields, uh, all sorts of information, uh, which is guided by uh, just about eight instruments uh, from, uh, from the Juno spacecraft. Uh, Juno has an uh, elliptical orbit, kind of like uh, the Parker Solar Probe, where it takes oh. it far from Jupiter and then very close to it, um, and the closest point to Jupiter um, <laughs> is known as perijove. So I always conflate the two things there. It's, <laughs> for the sun, it's, it's perihelion. But right. uh, when, when this spacecraft gets 
close to Jupiter. It's called Perigeo, which uh, I've indicated there. Uh, it's uh, with PJ. And the number next to it is its 38th um, Perigeo, which occurred on November uh, 29th last year. So, um, so let's go and look at the highlights here. So what happened last year? Well, at the beginning of last year, there was a news release that NASA expanded uh, this mission and then ex extended the mission of Juno. Uh, we take a look at the next, uh, this uh, chart here, which is basically the schedule or the schedule of the, of the flight of Juno. It's so much, there's so much detail here, but let's take a look at that little rectangle down at the bottom left there. Uh, what, what you see there is a number, which is uh, Perigeo's numbers. And uh, in that red uh, rectangle there, you see uh, Perigeo 35, right next to it is the orbit. That was supposed to be the end of the primary mission where um, if uh, the spacecraft wasn't doing so well, they would deorbit the spacecraft and, and they would burn up in the atmosphere on July 30th of the last year. Well, uh, they did an assessment at, at, at the end of uh, 2020 and uh, they found that uh, Juno was remarkably healthy. Uh, the instruments were good, uh, the spacecraft condition was good and it survived. Uh, many perigeo passages through uh, Jupiter's intense uh, radiation uh, belts. So because it was good, they extended the mission for another 40 perigeos. And so we're just looking at the new um, uh, schedule for the, uh, from last year and also for this year. And uh, you can see that uh, there were actually, including perigeo 33, uh, just that PJ on the left there, 32, sorry, there were seven uh, perigeos uh, last year. If you look at the orbit period, uh, you can see 53, that's 53 days. That's how long it, for 33 and 34, it would take to go around uh, Jupiter and do a perigeo pass. But then on uh, per perigeo 35, uh, the orbit has reduced by 10 days. And I will get into that as we uh, go forward into some of the discoveries made by uh, Juno. So what about these perigeo points? Well, the perigeo point for 38 occurs at 30 degrees uh, north of the equator of, uh, of Jupiter, but that has not always been the case. The first uh, perigeo uh, was August 27th in 2016, and that perigeo occurred right over the equatorial region of Jupiter. So since mm. then, it has moved northwards or kind of precess northwards. And this is really good news for the, uh, for the science team because uh, they can actually get a close look at something that we can't see from Earth. And that is the, uh, the polar regions of Jupiter. So uh, Juno actually flies directly over the North and South Pole, but to get a close look at this uh, region, is, um, is actually a bonus because we're so used to seeing Jupiter as a banded uh, planet as seen from Earth. But this is a unique view of the polar region, which looks very unlike uh, what we normally see when we uh, look at uh, Jupiter. One of the uh, science results from, from looking at the polar regions is this. This is an intrigued uh, scientists. We're looking down directly at the South Pole. And so the South Pole is right in the middle of that crosshair there. And you can see there's uh, the six cyclones there, mm -hmm. numbered one through six, and there's a plus there, which is not a very strong cyclone. And what's so special about this? Well, these cyclones seem to uh, orbit around cyclone six, and they're actually very stable. Um, here's a false color image on the left of uh, the cyclones, it forms a pentagon around the central cyclone mm -hmm. near the South Pole. So that was taken in uh, 2017, but look at October 2021. That pattern is still there and uh, scientists are wondering, well, how long is that gonna last? That's remarkably stable. Will last a few tens of years or hundreds of years. So a few more uh, perigeos uh, on this extended mission will uh, will enable scientists to uh, study these uh, uh, stable uh, kind of cyclone uh, 
things that are revolving around the central cyclone over the polar regions of Jupiter. And in the northern uh, pole, pole region, there is actually uh, something similar happening. Okay, now Juno, Juno also carries a microwave radiometer, which actually sees uh, microwaves from, uh, uh, from Jupiter. And the reason for this is that it enables uh, Juno to be able to see down deep below the visible cloud layers to a depth of uh, 200 miles. So we can see what's happening uh, in the atmosphere that deep. So here we have a, uh, what we call an anticyclone in the Northern hemisphere of Jupiter. Uh, it uh, rotates in a anticlockwise fashion. And then on the uh, right there, you can see the various layers starting with the top layer, which is visible and then all the uh, microwave layers, which represent temperatures. So uh, what we have here is a darker red is warm. And as you go down, it gets even warmer uh, where it's kind of bright yellow. And what is interesting about this is that the uh, storm actually forms an imprint, a warm imprint on the uh, layer that's uh, immediately below the visible layer, which is uh, six miles uh, above the uh, cloud layer and six miles below the cloud layer, minus uh, six miles, the imprint is still there. You get go down to 20 and then it changes color. So it gets cooler. It's a little darker at 50 miles. And it's believed that there's an inversion layer occurring just uh, above uh, the 50 mile um, uh, level mark, uh, maybe 10 to 15 miles. Uh, that may be uh, caused by, which, was, which coincides with uh, where water clouds uh, exist or where water is, uh, where water condenses. Um, another result is uh, the opposite of the cyclone, an anticyclone in the Northern Hemisphere rotating plotwise. And here you see the imprint is dark. It mean, it's, it's actually cooler below, right directly below the, uh, the um, anticyclone. And then there's an inversion layer somewhere between 20 to about uh, 50 miles where it starts to get warmer. Uh, let's see what we have. Okay, so we have a, uh, of course, the Great Red Spot, which is an anticyclone in the Southern Hemisphere, and just very consistent with the cyclone that we saw before. It is um, an anticyclone. It is cold beneath uh, the, the Great Red Spot, and then it gets warmer as uh, you go down to about 200 miles. One of the biggest questions that uh, scientists have asked for ages because they don't know is the, uh, how deep is the great red spot? Well, that was answered uh, last year when uh, Juno flew over the red spot twice and did some gravity measurements. And uh, from those gravity measurements, they were able to determine that uh, Juno, and actually, actually the great red spot is about 500 kilometers or 311 miles deep. That is uh, roughly the, uh, the height of the International Space Station um, as it orbits around Earth. So just imagine that's, that's how deep it is. But, it, but the Great Red Spot is a little bit wider than the Earth. So that was a definitive uh, result there that um, settled that big question. Something weird um, that scientists have been uh, looking at uh, is the magnetic field. On Earth, our magnetic field um, is very much like a bar magnet and it's kind of symmetrical. Um, you know, you have the North Pole and the South Pole. But here, uh, the North Pole, which is represented by that red region where the magnetic field lines uh, um, emanate from, do go to the South Pole right at the bottom of Jupiter. But there's another pole as well. There's a second South Pole, that blue region there, which is known as the uh, Great blue spot, a second magnetic field. This map shows the magnetic intensity of the mm -hmm. uh, of Jupiter's magnetic uh, anomalies. And this was, these measurements have been taken over 30 perigeos. And you can see that the North Pole, which is red, is not right at the geographic North Pole. And neither is that great uh, uh, blue spot, which is right at the equator there. There is a South Pole there. Uh, as well, but it, it does coincide with the South Pole. But what is interesting is that uh, that uh, those squiggly lines, the uh, black lines, 
are the zonal winds. And you notice that uh, just above the equator near the 30 degree mark, that the winds have, uh, have uh, moved the uh, magnetic <clears throat> field across uh, to the uh, east part of the planet. And then conversely, below the uh, blue spot, it's to the west. So it's showing us that these winds can be deep enough to affect the domino effect that's caused it's creating the magnetic field, uh, perhaps uh, 2,000 miles <clears throat> below the cloud tops of Jupiter. So one of the big highlights was a flyby of the largest moon in the solar system, uh, Ganymede, which is bigger than Pluto or Mercury. And uh, this was a picture taken from a distance of 645 miles. Mm -hmm. uh, the top part of the, uh, the moon is missing. Uh, so uh, artists got to work and uh, rendered the top and this shows the moon as a whole. As Juno passed this moon, um, the, uh, it twisted its orbit. So it got a little gravitational twist and changed the direction of the orbit. And now this is the point where the 53 day um, orbital period is reduced to 43 days because it flew by uh, this moon. It also measured the magnetic field. So there were a lot of results. There were results including um, the atmospheric circulation, uh, the origin of, uh, of dust uh, from, uh, from Mars creating zodiacal lights and X-ray auroras. Uh, but there was so much, uh, but anyway, uh, Juno is producing so many results. Okay, so in addition to all of that, uh, the last perigee uh, produced some really great uh, images and uh, we'll feature just a few of them here. Uh, so here we are looking down at the Northern region of Jupiter, uh, uh, latitude centered on uh, latitude 60 degrees north and north is on the left or on the right, sorry. Uh, on the left in this uh, circle, uh, there are two uh, cyclones and this is a reprojected uh, map showing the cyclones lie at latitude of 50 to about 55 degrees uh, north. Uh, this image here is just incredible. And what we're seeing oh. here is yeah. Um, I mean, it's, first of all, it's color enhanced, so you can actually see a lot of detail, but the oval feature is a cyclone. So remember how we had those, uh, that cyclone uh, with the microwaves. So that rotates uh, anticlockwise. And then the white feature, which is the white oval, is an anticyclone then right next to each other. And so since they rotate in opposite directions, they're drawing all those clouds and kind of squeezing them through in the middle there. And you can see a few features like the pop-up uh, uh, cumulus clouds, which create shadows on, uh, on the leaning edge of the uh, cyclone. And also the, on top of the kind of all, kind of all dotted on the uh, uh, anti-cyclonic uh, white oval. Incredible picture. This was taken at an altitude of uh, 3,815 miles um, right above these uh, two uh, uh, cyclones. All right, uh, just a quick look forward. Um, so we've seen that the mission got extended. We got our first flyby of uh, Ganymede. Uh, next up are these two close flybys of, uh, of the moons of Jupiter, uh, Europa, the icy moon, and the volcanic moon, uh, Io. In, uh, and uh, we'll take a look at these. This is the best picture of Europa uh, as seen from Juno from a distance of uh, 51,000 miles on perigee 37. Uh, this February on perigee 40, uh, Juno will pass uh, about 29,000 miles uh, from, uh, from uh, Europa. And then PJ 45, uh, which is uh, September 29th, Juno will swoop by Europa at a distance of 221 miles, giving us the most, most detailed image of Jupiter looking straight down at its North Pole. Um, other spacecraft are taking images from, from looking at the equator. This will be our first look at yeah. the polar region of, uh, of Europa. Uh, volcanic moon Io, uh, there'll be cl two close flybys, uh, one on December 30th of 2023, and the next one will be February 3rd of 2024. 
Io is very interesting. This is an infrared uh, image uh, taken from Juno showing those little bright hot spots. Every one of them are active volcanoes. And then uh, something mysterious that uh, Juno has not taken a look at in detail yet are the rings of Jupiter. This image was taken by the Voyager spacecraft. This image was taken last year by Juno looking from inside the rings uh, and outwards. And you can see the two mm. bright dusty rings. The kind of, uh, the caused by a tiny moons orbiting within the rings. Uh, Juno will be passing through these rings and measuring the impacts of these dust particles just to see how dense uh, the rings are of Jupiter. So we'll expect some interesting results. And of course, we'll continue to uh, show you the latest images from uh, Juno Cam. Um, but um, if you want to see more results, um, this is the website to go to to see all the incredible pictures uh, and, um, and research and results that Juno has produced. Okay, and I think it's on to pretty pictures with Katie. I was just going to say, I'm muted again. I'm over here oh, blabbering to myself. Oh, no, <laughs> that's what problem. happens when I'm just muted. Um, yeah, beautiful imagery as always from Juno, and it's going to be exciting to see those images of Europa and Io, um, if they're anything like that Ganymede image. So Katie, welcome, and uh, let's Thank take you. a look at some of your favorite images of the year and what's up in space weather. All right, so first we have these beautiful images, star images. These are all taken by telescope demonstrator Anthony Perkett. Um, from left to right, Betelgeuse, Sirius, Antares, and then we have Altair, um, Procyon, and Arcturus. And I love this one. This is the Needle Galaxy, NGC 4565. This is also by Anthony Perkick. And then, of course, the be beautiful Pleiades. This is a um, image of Jupiter and Saturn. Jupiter is the bright planet right in the middle there. And then uh, this is from Joshua Tree National Park. Um, and on the left there is Face Rock. This is by Todd Kunioka. And then these are some of my favorite images of the moon um, from last year. New York City on the left, I believe the middle one is Sweden and the one on the right is from Griffith Park. And a beautiful image of Griffith Observatory with Los Angeles in the background. This one's by um, Jerry Donkers Lee. And to some of my favorite cloud images of 2021, these are polar stratospheric clouds from Jörn Strand. He's, um, this was taken in Sweden as well. And I love this image, um, sun halo with a raven flying past over the same portion of the Ethereum. This one's by Anthony Perkick. And some of my favorite cloud images, Mimetis clouds on the left and uh, also Cumulus on the right. Those are Eric Whitaker on the right and uh, uh, Michael Johnston on the left. And this was an incredible gigantic jet. This was over Puerto Rico, over a big storm. Uh, Frankie Lucena, I believe, uh, captured that one. And then some Beautiful Aurora uh, from last year. This is Evan Zucker, and this is one of my favorites. On the right, you can actually see Orion in the background uh, behind the Aurora. This one's Euron Strawn, um, and I love this one because of the moon halo on the right. And then this one is great um, because it was taken just outside of Lincoln, California, uh, just a couple months ago. And then these are new images um, from December. This is uh, Jupiter, Saturn, and Venus, and then the moon on the top left. And then another one, this one, including Mercury. So this one's a little bit more recent, right after sunset from Griffith Observatory. And then Blake Estes took this. Um, this is JWST. Uh, oh, that's great. and some lovely uh, star trails around uh, Polaris. 
And then of course, the beautiful image of uh, Los Angeles with that incredible cloud layer and Mount Baldy in the background. And then these are beautiful colors before sunrise. This is from Uranstrand as well, uh, from Sweden. And on to uh, some solar activity. This is our sun from today. So you can see a couple of sunspots there, um, 2924 on the right and 2925 on the left. And that brings us to a little bit of um, solar cycle talk. So the, um, we are in the 25th solar cycle and the solar cycle happens roughly every 11 years. And this is not um, current data. So when the um, sun is at a solar minimum, we have less sunspots and solar maximum, you would see more sunspots. So the solar maximum is predicted to be around July of 2025 for this cycle. And then there are a couple partial solar eclipses coming up this year. Uh, you cannot see these from North America. April 30th and October 25th. And then we'll just show those uh, locations. On the left is April 30th in South America. And on the right, the October 25th, we'll be able to see a uh, partial solar eclipse in parts of Europe, Asia, and uh, Africa. There we go. Thank you, Katie. <clears throat> um, those Aurora photographs are really spectacular. That one taken in California of the red. Oh. You know, when you hear there's a, a chance of Aurora, you get out to a dark site, bring your camera, set it on exposed for a little while. And if you see those red colors, um, you might have caught something. Very, very cool. Yeah. Now, Patrick, what do we have in the sky? What did we have in the sky? What do we have in the sky coming? And what's on the moon behind me? Anyway, <laughs> uh, take it away. <laughs> Okay, well, what did happen last year? Oh, okay, well, let's start with this. Uh, so uh, as you may remember, we did broadcast the uh, lunar eclipse on uh, May 26th of last year. It was a total lunar eclipse. And here is a diagram uh, showing uh, the moon moving through the uh, Earth's uh, penumbra, which is the Earth's uh, lighter part lighter part of the Earth's shadow projected into space and then right into the umbra uh, at max greatest eclipse, which occurred at 418 early morning. Uh, so this uh, event uh, kept us uh, very busy um, here at the observatory as we streamed this eclipse uh, on the internet uh, to the world so everyone can see it. So the umbra is the darkest part of the Earth's shadow that's cast by the Earth. Um, onto the moon and the atmosphere of the Earth, of course, um, uh, bends uh, the light and particularly the red light uh, uh, ends up uh, on the moon, creating this beautiful orange um, uh, look for the moon during uh, mid eclipse. Okay, so uh, what was it like? Well, we started off the evening and the skies, as you can see here in this picture, looked pretty good. Uh, we streamed it from the roof. Uh, we had all our gear uh, set up. But as uh, the night wore on, uh, clouds began to form, so it worried us a little bit. Uh, but we were able to take these beautiful pictures of the uh, lunar eclipse as it progressed towards totality. And this is where it was closer to totality, but you're getting a little hint of those clouds. Unfortunately, uh, the totality moment was blocked by clouds, and then the clouds just cleared enough uh, several minutes after totality ended. You can see it in this image here. And we still got a beautiful um, a view of the uh, uh, total lunar eclipse. And then it got cloudy again. And then uh, when the moon was in partial eclipse, um, it got clear again. So there's a view of the moon uh, towards the west. Uh, the moon uh, was still in eclipse uh, as it was setting. But then uh, we basically observed through dawn as the moon had, had set. So that was that event, and it was very successful. And uh, our, our, uh, we have a record of that eclipse. There's a one-minute version, and you can watch the full, um, I think it's like three-hour version um, on our, our YouTube channel. There was a second eclipse, a uh, lunar eclipse, in November. And uh, this one was not a total eclipse. It was a partial, uh, partial one or a partial lunar eclipse. And here's the track, uh, the moon moved through the, uh, the umbra and uh, basically clipped the southern edge of the, uh, 
of the darkest part of the Earth's shadow, the umbra there. At mid-eclipse, uh, the moon was almost total. Um, in fact, 97% uh, 90, of the moon fell um, within the umbra. So it was a near total or an almost total lunar eclipse. Um, the weather was not very kind um, oh, oh. That, that night. It was, <laughs> there was a lot of marine layer. It, even though the observatory is about a thousand feet above sea level, we thought we might be just high enough to uh, get a clear view of the eclipse uh, uh, from up near the top of the marine layer. But unfortunately, the marine layer was a little bit higher than the observatory. But we were able to get uh, peaks uh, of the uh, of the partial lunar eclipse, and this was taken just a few uh, minutes after it was uh, it was complete after the maximum eclipse. So we did get, at least get a good view of it. Uh, also, uh, we had many observers, including yeah, our as always. Team, including our director, who was definitely dressed for the occasion and photographing the uh, the partial uh, lunar eclipse. Uh, he was dressed because we were going to uh, shortly after the the maximum eclipse occurred, we were going to chase the dragon away. All right, so what happened with the planets? Well, we were kind of fortunate this year for planets in the evening sky. Uh, if you look down there towards the uh, horizon near the middle of the picture, Venus emerged, began to merge, and its apparent motion took it uh, eastward away from the sun, and has, it climbed higher as the months, summer months went by. Um, and it was visible also through um, autumn and, and also into winter. And it was uh, joined as we moved around the uh, sun, joined by the two uh, largest planets in the solar system, Jupiter and Saturn. So there were three planets that uh, observers can enjoy. And indeed they did. They were able to photograph and observe uh, Venus, um, also the planet Jupiter and take these superb pictures. Um, and here's a view of uh, Saturn. And as a bonus, and this is an unexpected bonus, a comet flew by and it made, made its close, closest approach uh, to Earth on December 12th. Now, this comet uh, was predicted to be just naked eye. Unfortunately, it was only visible through binoculars and telescopes, so it wasn't bright enough that you could actually see it from the city, but it was impressive um, as... Um, amateur astronomers were able to uh, capture these incredible images of uh, Comet Leonard. Now this comet is a long period comet and as it swung around the sun, it's on its way out uh, away from the sun and will not return uh, for another 80,000 years. So that's just kind of like a one once in a lifetime event um, if you see it. Okay, so this takes us to this year. So what do we have to look forward for this year? Well, let's take a look uh, in the January sky and uh, we'll begin with a January sky report. Uh, at the beginning, so we're gonna backtrack to uh, last week, on New Year's Day, uh, if you were to look in the evening sky towards the Southwest, there were four planets visible, Venus uh, being the lowest, uh, close to the horizon, followed by Mercury, Saturn, and Jupiter, which, which was uh, much higher up. And then we had our annual quadrantid meteor shower, uh, which produces about 12 meteors per hour. This year, conditions were favorable because the moon was uh, close to new. Um, and then there was, uh, um, the moon uh, was visible between uh, Saturn and, and Jupiter uh, on the fourth, uh, on that evening after the quadrantid uh, maximum, meteor shower maximum. And then uh, just before our broadcast tonight, if you look towards the West, there are only three planets visible. Venus has gone. Venus is now moving eastward and it's moving in front of the, uh, the Earth and the Sun, between the Earth and the Sun, and uh, will move into the morning sky uh, towards the end of the month. So we've lost Venus, but you can see Mercury, which is at its greatest Eastern elongation or greatest east, distance east of the Sun, uh, this is a favorable time to see this uh, planet, which is which most people actually haven't seen. And then we have uh, Saturn and Jupiter, which is much higher up. Now, the winter sky in general in the evening is filled with uh, constellations that sparkle throughout uh, our cold January nights. And within this circle, 
there is an asterism known as the winter hexagon or winter circle. And you can see it by drawing lines between the bright stars um, of the winter constellations. So here's how you do it. So we start with Rigel in Orion Hunter, drawing line to Aldebaran in Taurus de Bull, which is a reddish star, going upwards uh, from the south, because we're looking south, to uh, Capella, which is a yellowish star in um, Origa, and then moving south eastwards to uh, Castor, which is in the constellation of Gemini the Twins, down to Procyon in Canis Major, Minor, sorry, the little dog, and then to the brightest star in the night sky, Sirius, in the constellation of Canis Major, the great dog. And then completing the winter hexagon, uh, going back to Rigel, that is it. Those are the stars of the winter circle or uh, winter hexagon. So go out and try that on our cold uh, winter nights. Um, in the, as a bonus, uh, you draw a line for, from um, uh, Betelgeuse to uh, Procyon and uh, Sirius, you get the winter triangle. In the more early morning sky, uh, the sky is uh, filled with the constellations of the spring. So we're gonna get a little sneak peek, peek of the constellations um, in our spring sky if you were to get up early. Uh, starting with uh, Leo the Lion and its brightest star Regulus, and then to the south, uh, Spica in the constellation of Virgo the Maiden. And then up to this orange star, the fourth brightest star in the sky, Arcturus in Beauties the Herdsman. And way down there is a reddish star, which is Chris's uh, favorite star, Antares in the constellation of Scorpius the Scorpion, which has just begun to emerge from the bright glare of the sun. Looking towards the end of the month, uh, we have a nice configuration of the moon and uh, the, the waning crescent moon and Mars, and the planet Venus, which has finally made its way into the morning sky after disappearing from, from our evening sky. Moon phases for this month, uh, new is on the second, first quarter is the sec is the ninth, full moon is the 17th, last quarter is the 25th, and we have a new moon on the 31st, so there's two new moons um, in this month. And two moon, new moons in a month is called a black moon. Uh, when you have two new moons, two full moons in the same month, it's a blue moon. All right, so uh, what do we have to look forward to to the rest of the year? Well, we have another total lunar eclipse. Why do we have so many total lunar eclipses? Well, it turns out that um, this is the uh, third eclipse out of four um, in what is called a lunar eclipse uh, tetrad, uh, which, uh, which uh, is, by definition is uh, four um, lo consecutive lunar eclipses, uh, six months apart. So notice the date here, it's uh, May 15th. Uh, the last one was May 26, kind of a few days apart there, almost a year away. And this one, uh, you can see that the moon uh, moves into near the central part of the, uh, of the umbra and uh, will give us a long uh, eclipse. Uh, but this one is actually interesting because it occurs much earlier, it occurs as the moon is rising from Los Angeles. So it will be an early evening event and the moon will be a uh, total uh, on at 9, 11 p.m. Uh, Pacific Daylight Time um, to the Southeast. So we'll, there'll be more about this. A spectacular event in the morning sky occurs when there are five planets all lined up, including the moon. And the planets are actually lined up in order of the distance from the sun. Uh, so <laughs> to the northeast, uh, uh, right at the, close to the horizon to the northeast, you have Mercury. Higher up is Venus. Then you have the moon, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And then uh, after that, uh, we have the, uh, the next event, which is our final uh, lunar eclipse of the uh, lunar eclipse uh, tetrad, uh, which occurs on uh, November 8th. And um, this one occurs in the early morning. So the moon goes total on the 8th at uh, 2.59 um, a.m. That's that maximum eclipse over in the west. 
And to cap off um, the biggest events of this year um, in the sky, um, on December 7th, the moon will move in front of the planet Mars and uh, the moon will hide Mars for about an hour and then emerges from the other, um, the eastern limb of the moon. Uh, this will be a fantastic opportunity to observe it because in the evening around about 6.30 and Mars will be actually one day from its opposition. So it will be very bright and it will be uh, not hard to miss. And uh, a pair of binoculars uh, or even a small telescope is recommended to observe this grand disappearance of the um, moon, of rather the, the planet Mars behind the moon. So that's what we have to look for uh, for this year. And we'll be covering all of that in our sky reports. Well, thank you, Patrick. It's going to be an exciting year up in the sky. And that Mars moon occultation, that's going to be fun to watch their telescope. So a good reason to go out and pick up one um, if you want to see that. Um, well, we are now to the part of the show where we're going to find out what's been going on with launches. It's out yeah. to launch. Chris Butler. Chris, what's been going on over the year and what are we looking forward to? Well, actually, it's kind of interesting uh, what Patrick was just talking about there with Mars and the moon, uh, with the moon uh, getting uh, front and center uh, compared to Mars. Uh, actually, it's thematically appropriate. You, you guys will see what I mean. Um, we are doing a forwards and backwards look this time. We're going to look back at 2021. And of course, we'll address some of the very important things that are going on right now as we speak. Um, and then look forward to 2022. Now, 2022 is going to have a little bit of a, a different complexion. It'll be different in a couple different ways this year from last year. Um, one of the things you may remember, if you're thinking back on 2021, a lot of the things we talked about in All Space Considered, we've talked a lot about Mars, but not Mars launches. There weren't any Mars launches, but we were talking about results from Mars. Usually these things are very distinctive and very different one from the other. In February of last year, uh, it's hard to remember, this really was this recently, three spacecraft arrived at Mars. Now, Dr. Reitzel is going to talk more about that in a minute. The point I want to make here is that usually it's when the vehicles arrive that we start getting the results. And that time is usually quite a long time after the launch because these places are a long way away. That's normal. In 2022, we're gonna see something a little bit different because a lot of launches are going to be occurring to a destination closer than the distant planets. So the arrivals will be much faster. Now, I will say that, yes, we had magnificent results all year from these missions at Mars. That'll continue into, of course, 2022 as well. Uh, and to talk about things we were talking about last year, um, space stations. Uh, that's with an S at the end, space stations, because the International Space Station was joined by the Chinese space station that launched their core module in late April. Uh, so they got started on the construction of that. They have sent uh, not astronauts, but taikonauts, which is what the Chinese call their spacefarers, uh, up to it. They will be uh, doing more missions to it and enlarging it throughout 2022. And by the way, we've talked about the International Space Station. During this last year, we had two new uh, modules arrive at the International Space Station, the Nauka module and the Perchal module. They both arrived set up by the Russians. Now, a point I want to make about that, we've talked about whether or not the International Space Station is coming to the end of its lifespan. Well, here we are sending up new modules. We're reinvesting in the space station. We're enlarging it, in fact. And looking ahead to 2022, just recently, the US and Russia have agreed to operate the station at least to 2028. And the US has indicated they'd like to operate it till 2030. So that'd be eight years from now. So space stations last year, but also you'll see a lot more space station support in 2022. All right. Uh, we don't usually talk too much about uh, space tourism, Pe people going up just to have fun. Well, I mean, that's not really space science as such, although it is important that new vehicles are coming online, like the Virgin Galactic space, space plane that you see on the left there and the uh, new Shepard suborbital rocket on the right. 
these are new space vehicles and we've noted their success. Um, it is true from a historical perspective that in July of last year, private citizens riding on private spacecraft entered space for the first time. Now there've been some space tourists before, but they were on government spacecraft, okay? They bought a seat on that. This is all private, as was the uh, launch of a crew of, of well, crew? Yeah, by the way, maybe we don't even use the term anymore. Um, participants, passengers, uh, for passengers on a SpaceX Dragon in September, took the first purely private mission on a private vehicle into Earth orbit. Now that's also something to look forward to in the future because we're gonna have the Axiom 1 mission, again, riding on a Crew Dragon. They're actually gonna to go to the space station. We'll talk more about that later. The main thing was looking back at 2021, the start of private tourism spaceflight. So a, a historic moment. Uh, as far as science missions, uh, Two of the ones that strike me as being especially important from last year, uh, the Lucy mission uh, launched in October successfully. And I just love where it's going. It's an exotic place, the Trojan asteroids out by the orbit of Jupiter. These are completely unexplored. Uh, I've been fascinated by this my whole life, uh, wondering what the Trojan asteroids were like. Well, now, as I mentioned, usually launches like Lucy's happen a long time before you get there. It won't be arriving for many years, but safely on its way. Now, DART is the double asteroid redirection test, a uh, good name for it. Um, that launched in November. And interestingly, its destination is not so far away. And well, you'll see what's gonna happen at its destination. I'll talk about that in a moment because it's going to arrive at November of this year. So about a one year flight to its destination. It's an important mission, we'll talk about it in a moment. Well, obviously the big Christmas present for all of us was the launch of the uh, James Webb Space Telescope, the successful launch from South America of this very long awaited telescope. Uh, at long last, after years of delays and everything else, the, the Webb Telescope is indeed on its way. And then of course you remember, what the drama was going to be at the end of the year. Uh, if you want drama, uh, we have all been sitting here on uh, pins and needles for quite a while. Uh, as the drama unfolds, story of a telescope that just needs to open up. And we don't mean emotionally, we mean physically, because that thing was folded up like crazy to fit this giant instrument inside the launch shroud, the nose cone of its rocket. And this process, uh, we've talked about it before, you've seen me getting nervous about this. Wow, complicated. Um, but you know what? I'm here to report to you tonight. We've gotten every single step except the very, very last one has been successfully accomplished. We are almost there. The web telescope's almost completely uh, deployed as of now. Now, not quite. The next step's tomorrow. If, and you, you want to keep tabs on this. If you want to watch what's going on with this. Um, there's a website, actually, the Goddard Space Flight Center uh, has this website out there. And it's the one I've been going to and going to and going to and going to, checking on this as we, we came up on every uh, step. And it's allowed me to follow through. This shows uh, the current status of the telescope. You can watch the next step. You can play a little movie. Of course, now there's only one more step. They've unfolded this, the sunshade. Uh, for the telescope. The optics for the telescope are now the secondary mirror has swung out in front. One of the two side panels of the telescope's mirror is out. Tomorrow, the last one clicks in and then we'll be set, okay? Well, actually that'll be the start. Uh, this is a perfect time to start talking about the future, about 2022 really, because you all will be asking, when do we get our first picture, right? Well, it's gonna take time to commission the telescope. A good guess as to when we might get the first really amazing pictures, maybe something like the middle of 2022, should be about right. And then it'll start years and years and years of operation up there in space. So very, very good news for the end of the year and the start of this new year. 
Um, one of the things I thought I'd be talking about with you at this time was going to be a, a test of the SpaceX giant rocket, the Starship system being built in South Texas. Um, however, that's been delayed a little bit, but partly because they've been doing lots of testing and so forth with the vehicle uh, down at the SpaceX site in Boca Chica, Texas, but more to the point because the Federal Aviation Administration is still working on their approval of the launch. Remember, they're not trying to launch this from Cape Canaveral from a government missile range. They're trying to launch it from land that's actually pretty close to Brownsville, Texas. And this is a rocket as powerful as the Saturn V. So they have been saying, well, we need a little more time to process uh, a public comment and things like this. The thought is, the FAA is saying, uh, round about March, beginning of March is when they'll be able to make their pronouncement, and I'm sure they're going to approve it. They're just going through the process. So first part of the year in springish, we should expect to see the first of hopefully many launches of the Starship system in 2022. Um, the Artemis uh, 1 mission is going to launch. That's also looking like March. Uh, so it's going to be a busy march for giant rockets. This is a launch of the Space Launch System, NASA's giant Saturn V size moon rocket, taking the Orion spacecraft, no astronauts, this is just a test, to actually do distant orbits around the moon and also carry some other payloads to the moon. But this is the starting gun in many ways of what makes 2022 so different. I've said it's going to be a different kind of year, and this is what I mean. We've talked and talked and talked for years about maybe someday astronauts would go back to the moon, we'd establish the scientific outpost, all the rest of that. You've got to wonder, well, when does it really start to happen? Now, we're not putting astronauts on the moon this year, but we are sure sending the first uh, wave of probes and support vehicles and tests that's all starting to happen now in 2022. And it's going to be different because when we talk about these kinds of launches, we aren't going to be waiting years until you get there. The moon is just about four days away, depending on how fast you try to get there. So when all space, if we talk about a launch one month to the moon, check with this next month, there'll be pictures and results. So this will come at you fast and furious. A um, couple of things you may see or may not see. Tests of vehicles. We've talked about the Boeing uh, Starliner. It had a lot of problems. Uh, they were going to launch last year. Didn't get a chance to. Will they this year? They're hoping mid-year, but we'll see. We'll see. Uh, the Dream Chaser cargo space plane, the cargo version of their space plane, uh, they're, they are hoping to maybe get a flight off in 2022. It would be towards the end of the year, but that's not a for sure thing. And the same definitely can be said for the gigantic, the third of these gigantic rockets, uh, the new Glenn rocket from uh, Blue Origin. They actually are hoping to maybe get it off in uh, the end of this year. But again, color me skeptical. There's a lot of work to do yet. Um, as far as lunacy, uh, there's going to be a lot of lunacy this year. And that means moon probes. This means moon activity. Um, some of this will start with, uh, in March, the Capstone mission. Uh, well, we'll talk about it, of course, before it happens. Uh, Capstone is a vehicle, a small probe, to go out and actually research an orbit. Scientists, uh, theoreticians have designed a distant orbit around the moon where they want to put a moon uh, space station, basically orbiting the moon. This vehicle is going to go out and make sure that orbit behaves the way they think it will. It's an interesting complex uh, orbit. Um, and then there are landers and landers and landers of all different kinds coming in there. Uh, we're gonna be landing, I believe, in Mare Serenitatis, uh, one of the probes. Um, I wanna draw your attention to Luna 25. That's not the United States. That's Russia getting back into the moon lander game. The last time they landed on the moon, 1976 and they're getting back into it now. This is really gonna heat up and other nations are interested too. In fact, all told, they're thinking about 15 launches to the moon conducted by nine nations in 2022. Lunacy, it's gonna be really exciting. 
there will be the launches to other places like the JUICE mission, the Jupiter Icy Satellites mission of the European Space Agency. That will launch in May, but of course they're not going to the moon, they're going to Jupiter. So it'll be years until they arrive, but the launch is in May. Um, we also have, oh, I'm psyched for this one. It'll take a while to get there. This is an asteroid mission to one of my favorite asteroids, Psyche. The asteroid Psyche, the most metallic of all the asteroids. We're going to have our first ever mission to Psyche. Again, takes a little while to get there, but the launch, August 1st, I'm going to be excited for that one. Um, for you Mars folks, I don't want to let you uh, feel left out. We do have a Mars launch coming up this year, September, uh, the XO Mars rover. Uh, or part lander or rover actually will launch in September. Uh, this will be a, a Mars landing and a rover for the European Space Agency. But obviously, it won't arrive right then. But we'll keep our fingers crossed for the launch in September. We're going to wind up the year with a bang, literally. I uh, mentioned the DART mission, the double asteroid redirection test, uh, a first planetary defense test we've ever had to see if we used a spacecraft and hit an asteroid, could we deflect its path a little bit? This one's not coming towards us, folks. There's no danger to us. They're testing the capability of doing this, but the very, very, very first test is going to arrive in November. And it's gonna slam the spacecraft into this little moon of an asteroid. And so we will end the year begin the year, all of it, with lots of excitement. So that's, that's a report on what's out to launch, Dr. Reitzel. Back to you. Well, that's all we have going on. I, I, it's going to be such a slow <laughs> year. Nothing to look forward to. Uh, no, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, the DART mission is one of my favorites. Um, although, I, I don't know how many of you have seen that movie, Don't Look Up, but uh, makes you wonder if <laughs> yeah. it would get used at all if we figure out how to uh, the technology on doing that. So anyway. Onward and upward to our final story um, tonight. Let's talk about what's happened at Mars. Mars, of course, um, one of our nearest neighbors. Um, uh, people have wondered about Mars forever. Uh, people used to think, well, maybe it's somewhere there could be liquid water. We saw signs of um, dark areas coming and going. It wasn't really understood. They thought maybe this is vegetation or water being delivered or something happening. Um, little did we know it was really dust storms and <laughs> maybe a few high clouds covering up things, obscuring what we could see down below. But it doesn't mean that it wasn't a great year to send, um, like Chris said, some spacecraft to Mars. And of course, the Hope Orbiter um, was sent there. And it was sent by the Emirates Mars mission, as you can see there. And it's actually made some interesting discoveries. Um, mm -hmm. You can see here, Mars aurorae are kind of difficult to see. Um, all the spacecraft we have are so low and so close to Mars. Previously, they were a little different, difficult to be able to picture. But this um, orbiter was able to see these discrete aurorae on Mars. And, um, you know, it's kind of the bright crackles seen on the night side. Let me see if I can get my laser pointer out here for you. Um, laser pointer on, here we go. It's this stuff over on the night side you're seeing that's the signs of the aurora on Mars, not the bright daylight glow that's over there. So that's a, a first that we've seen that sort of distribution from so far away. Another mission, of course, the landing of a rover on Mars. It was so exciting. The Chinese rover, Zhurong landed, was deployed on May 22nd, 2021. Um, you can see their parachute there and the rover with these great big, huge solar panels on it. It is a solar one. They brought a little uh, selfie camera with them. It drove over, dropped off the selfie camera, backed up, and wow, cute right. little rover. I love that little face that it has there. It's, it's sort of pondering the, the selfie. Um, although, I don't know, they should have stuck a selfie stick on it. It would have been cute, I think. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> now, anyway, um, there's not a whole lot of information coming from this rover. The Chinese have been pretty quiet about it. A few papers have been uh, released just kind of talking about the the rocks and analysis, but not much there. It was really off, I think, the friction um, of the driving over there. So the movement of the wheels they were looking at. But so far, they're pretty silent about the, the data. They're being rather closed about the science that's coming out of this. But congratulations to them. So that's really the big excitement for Mars. And that was about it this year. So thank you so much. Of course, I'm kidding. Uh, of course, I'm kidding. Uh, uh, you know, right next to you're wrong. Well, in, in between, 
um, Zhurong's in between Viking II and of course, Perseverance, the, the, the major landing of, of NASA's at Mars this year. And we did indeed land, it uh, entered February 18th, 2021. And we're gonna show this video of the, the entry and descent and landing again. Uh, we put together a little bit of the animation to fill in some of the areas uh, we added in to show you what it looks like off to the side. Wonderful job by our, our, by our video editor, uh, Sarah Vincent did a really wonderful job with this. So thank you so much. I hope you enjoy this short video about the landing of Perseverance on Mars. Alpha indicate shoot deploy. The navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 440 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Heat shield set. Perseverance has now slowed to subsonic speeds and the heat shield has been separated. This allows both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second and an altitude of about 10 kilom nine and a half kilometers above the surface. Back shell set. Current velocity is 83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. Here in safety, Bravo. We have completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. <laughs> we have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. Sky crane maneuver has started, about 20 meters off the surface. We're getting signals from MRO. Tango Delta. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. So that is just craziness. Um, the fact that we saw that sky crane fly away. Um, this is all the steps that had to happen. Um, first comes in, heat shield is protecting it, uh, peak heating, that heat shield gets ejected shortly after that parachute comes out. Radar lock on the ground so you know how far away you are, can start tracking. And then um, literally the, the back shell gets ejected and you go into free fall until they light those rocket engines and the power descent. The, the radar is seeing the ground. They're getting a lock on the ground. They had imagery from orbit that they had programmed into the cameras that it was recognizing features on the ground as it was flying over to be able to figure out, am I in the right spot? Then it cuts away, um, literally lands, well, lowers it on cables. The rover's there and the, that sky crane is cut away and we saw it fly off and it crashes off in the distance. So a completely amazing, amazing landing. Um, and it touched down just beautifully uh, right in the middle of Jezero Crater. Now that parachute, you might remember that sort of is weird looking. Now they do that partially to be able to track the motion of it, see how it's deployed, be able to see what's happening to the parachute, but also, well, JPL, they're, they're, they're a little bit of tricksters. <laughs> uh, remember our Curiosity rover, they put JPL into the wheels. It would roll and in Morse code would write JPL, JPL, JPL. So they literally, um, tagged the surface of Mars in their rover tracks. Now the dust is gonna, or the winds are gonna blow that away. It's not permanent or anything. This time they decided to print it on the, the parachute. And indeed you can go in and figure out the code to, to see what is all that, all those patterns. Well, it was a code and it spells out dare mighty things um, with a little bit of a latitude and longitude there. I'll let you go look that up and maybe you'll figure out what that location is. <laughs> It'll be a little bit fun for you. So, so type that into to Google and see what you find out on, on maps or one of them. Um, now the landing site, you can see the Phoenix Insight uh, landing ellipse that goes off of the screen actually here. Uh, very, very large, not a lot of control over where we're gonna land it, but pretty good overall. Curiosity smaller, about 15 miles by 12 miles. Well, the Perseverance landing site was much smaller. They were targeting in an area that was only 4.8 miles by 4.1 miles. 
Well, how'd they do? Let's take a look here. Um, they are almost in the very center of that small circle, right in the area where they wanted to be. It was a spectacular um, landing, spectacularly uh, precise landing of that rover. It was even pictured from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. I saw a picture of it. It was a little tiny, tiny parachute down in there, but they did catch it coming down. Now, uh, interesting enough, some of these features that uh, Perseverance is seeing are being named after uh, Navajo names. Uh, to celebrate the Navajo language and the contributions to JPL and space and science. That rock right there is called Maz, which of course is the Navajo word for Mars. You can see here a, a close up of it. And uh, there were measurements taken of it. And uh, this, is, uh, this is the rock Yigo, which means diligent. And I'll mm -hmm. show you uh, the region that these were taken from in just a, a minute or two. And some of the the information we're learning from it. Now the path that it's taking, the, the rover first landed here at Octavia E. Butler landing site. And I recommend uh, science fiction books by Octavia E. Butler. Check it out, um, great name for the landing site. And then the rover decided to go sort of south and then wrap around over here to this um, Saita North and South site. I don't know how to pronounce that by the way. I'm sorry if I'm causing problems there, but that was a, a reason to go investigate some of the terrain. They thought this is an opportunity before we sweep back around and head over to the Three Forks, which wasn't that a, 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 a inn or a, a tavern in Lord of the Rings, the Three Forks Tavern. <laughs> it should be. Uh, so anyway, no, it wasn't, of course. But of course, the, the Perseverance, the rover didn't go alone. It brought a helicopter with it. Indeed, Ingenuity, the little helicopter, was brought to the surface and they thought, well, we'll fly a couple of times. It is a test mission. It's a lot like um, the Pathfinder mission that taught us how to rove on Mars. Well, this Pathfinder mission for Ingenuity is gonna teach us how to fly a helicopter. They thought, well, we'll get two, three flights off, maybe four, it'll probably break, it could crash, but we'll learn how to fly on Mars. Well, we have flown now 18 times, um, it has gone back and forth. It's getting good data. They're learning more and more how to control it. It's actually doing some scouting for Perseverance to kind of see where Perseverance could go. It's, it's turning out to be a very handy tool to have with us and we've learned a lot. So we put together a little video to help you enjoy what, Perse what Ingenuity has been doing as my other cat's <laughs> coming to visit now. So let's take a look at this, this video that we put together on Ingenuity and enjoy the music as well. So we're not just flying around for fun, playing, uh, you know, playing with our helicopter there on Mars, although that was actual footage. That footage was taken by Perseverance. So you are watching a helicopter with, anyway, it just blows my mind that JPL pulls this stuff off and it works, mm -hmm. it gets there. And we're flying two vehicles, well, we're flying a vehicle and we're roving a vehicle right next to each other. Um, super, super cool stuff. Well, the science coming from Perseverance is pretty darn cool too. Uh, the Sherlock ultraviolet spectrometer has, along with the pixel X-ray spectrometer have been used to piece together what's going on with those rocks under the rover's wheels. Um, you can see here, the um, this is Sherlock here, the camera mm -hmm. and a laboratory image of the sorts of you know cool uh, glows that you get out of this when you're seeing organics and things like that, that it's looking for. Indeed, Sherlock's looking for some organics. We thought there would be organics in Jezero Crater. Um, this is a, 
of course, an image from orbit showing those greens that we're looking for. And we thought, well, let's go look for them in this crater and see if the water that washed through there interacted with the rocks and maybe left these organics. Now, organics don't mean life necessarily, but they're the molecules and elements that life needs and the sort of stuff that you'd need if maybe there were little organisms there in the past. So very exciting indeed. Um, th those instruments were indeed saying, yeah, there are organics there. Sher Sherlock is seeing evidence that water has interacted with this material and that organics are there. Now the pixel and RIMFAX has al also been used. The X-ray spectrom spectrometer and the subsurface radar have been making some neat uh, discoveries as well. This is pixel here. And um, they were able to look at rock nicknamed BRAC. And they were wondering what it was made of because it seemed to have a lot of large crystals. Those crystals did indeed turn out to be olivine. And this rock with these crossed crystals, we think formed in underground. It was a magma that cooled and came together and those crystals form under certain conditions. So the geologists are gonna be able to look at these rocks and what these instruments are measuring and tell us, Let me maybe I should show you the actual re region, true color above and enhanced color to make it look more like it would look on earth down below. And they were wondering, are these rocks volcanic? Are these rocks sedimentary? How did they get there? Well, it turns out they were volcanic. Like I said, it was magma under Mars's surface that cooled, cooled slowly enough to let these crystals come together. Then water interacted with it over and over and over again. So it's the combination of this magma and these crystals and the waters. So this is gonna be a very, very interesting story as we put together um, all these measurements that Perseverance is making. But so far we've learned that the floor it's driving on, it's not sedimentary, it's volcanic. So to get to those deposits that are sedimentary that might have life in them, maybe buried into the layers, it's gonna to have to drive somewhere else or look at some other sorts of deposits. But we are learning about Jezero Crater and we need to do that if we're gonna understand the other deposits. So moving along here, I mentioned that RIMFAX instrument. Well, it's actually a downward penetrating radar, a radar that penetrates the ground. So you can look for rocks that are uh, denser. You can look for sands that are less dense, um, dusty areas. Well, what is it seeing as it drives along? You can see up above is the, the top view looking down and it drove along this path, kind of going over these interesting ridges, interesting features. Well, down below is penetrating down into the ground. And you can line up some of the features here. You can see T3, this set of hills, they're little, they must be harder, denser, more difficult to erode. They penetrate down into the ground. They continue down into the ground below. Also notice these sort of slanted features coming up out. I'm wondering, it seems to me those are probably created from the impact itself that tilted the layers when that in when the basin itself was formed. But um, this ground penetrating radar completely new. It's showing us details about how deeply these hills penetrate. And um, very, very interesting to see these erosion resistant hills going uh, deep into the ground. Now the path we're gonna be taking here, like I said, we've been uh, driving all around over in this region. Well, the sediments we're interested in are really over here by Three Forks. So um, we are looking forward to moving off in another direction in, in the future. So we're gonna go explore the, the rest of this big basin and see how that water interacted and see if maybe any signs of life were left behind. Well, we've been looking already. You need to study the rocks as you move around and Perseverance has the ability to take samples. It drills in, pulls out a core, puts it in a canister, seals it up, stores it and moves on. And then later we need to figure out a way to analyze those. I'm not exactly sure. Um, how long we're going to have to wait for this, but some of the instruments that we analyze rocks with are literally the size, and by the way, as I'm talking about things, I guess I should show them to you. These are the samples Perseverance has taken already. So you can see these rocks are different color, different textures. They look different. Now the geologists will look at these and say, oh, I think this might be a rock that could contain certain amounts of information. Um, and then you need a different rock to see different things. You know, you, you analyze all these different structures and you put together the whole story of what's happening in the crater. Now, to do this, you need instruments that are big, much, much bigger than you can bring with you on a rover to Mars. So the idea is we will return, that we will go back to Mars and pick these up later and return them to Earth. 
So that's all coming in the future. And I don't think it's coming in 2022, just so you know. <laughs> It's not coming in 2023, <laughs> I don't think, but um, you can see here, indeed, uh, there is some initial drawings of what this thing might look like. It's gonna come down and land. It'll have a rover that'll be able to go over and grab them. Maybe they'll have some sort of helicopter or something that'll grab them. I kind of doubt it, but the way Ingenuity is flying, it makes me yeah. wonder. Now, I've got big questions about this. I'm sure you do too. Um, why samples? How long do we have to wait? Is it gonna be 2030s? Well, we're exceptionally lucky. Next month at All Space Considered, we have Dr. Matt Gollenbeck back with us to talk all about Mars. And I'm going to ask him these questions. Um, what, what's the sample return mission going to be like? Are they going to just leave these, you know, test tubes sealed on the ground to Mars? And do they got to go drive and get them from a bunch of different places? Or are they going to find one nice place that has maybe a little bit of shade and um, protection from the dust devils? I don't know. Um, but anyway, so we're super happy to have Matt come join us next month at All Space Considered. And I'm sure hoping all of you come join us as well um, next month and that you have a very safe and, uh, and, and a good January. I know things out there are getting a little bit crazy right now, but if everybody stays safe, we can get through this together. Um, I, I do want to mention Griffith Observatory is open right now, three days a week on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It is free it is open to the public, but you do need to bring your proof of vaccination. If you're over 12 years old, 12 and older, you need to bring your ID with you if you're 18 and older. And um, please be patient about entering the building. Um, sometimes the lines can be a little bit long and the parking and the rest, but we are open those days and uh, we appreciate you coming up to visit us and looking through our telescopes. Um, thank you, Chris, for joining us tonight. As always, Chris Butler, yeah. Patrick, so wonderful job with the sky and uh, Juno and everything else. I wanna thank our whole team that makes All Space Considered possible. Uh, Matthew, who's in the booth, um, Brendan, Katie, of course, with the pretty pictures. Um, she does a wonderful job putting this together. She's my co-executive producer of this show and everyone else. And if you stick around and take a look at the credits, you can see everybody that's responsible. Um, we couldn't do this show without them. And we also could not do this show without the city of Los Angeles, the Department of Recreation and Parks, and also Griffith Observatory Foundation. Um, you'll see we have a fundraiser there running and helps support our school program and other great projects and shows just like this one, All Space Considered. So thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you for the contributions. Um, thank you to our wonderful moderators and our great audience in the chat. And we'll see you next month at All Space Considered.